This podcast is part of the SJ Network. Go to s-j-network.com for more great podcasts and for contact information on publicist Steve Joyner. are listening to In a City Like Yours, a semi-monthly podcast featuring interesting people with interesting life stories. This podcast may contain language and or subject matter not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, Michael G. Moore. Please visit our website at inacitylikeyours.com. That's I-N-A-C-I-T-Y L-I-K-E-Y-O-U-R-S dot C-O-M for links to our social media, all popular podcast platforms, and links of interest pertaining to all episodes. Here is this week's story. Hi, yes, my name is Dwayne Epstein. I'm calling here from uh, Long Beach, beautiful Long Beach, California. It's a little rainy out today, but it's still always great to live by the beach. I was born in a beach city. I was born in uh, Coney Island in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, let's see, what can I tell you about my love of movies, which is where this is probably all going to wind up. <clears throat> according to my mother, I have two older sisters. And according to my mother, when we would go, she would pack, my, my parents would pack up the station where I can go to a drive-in. If my mother is to be believed, I was a movie fan because she used to talk to me about how my two older sisters would be asleep in the back seat. And I'm a baby, I don't know, six months to a year old. And I was staring at the flickering screen, refusing to go to sleep. So my mother believes my love of movies was infused almost since birth. Um, and I like to think she was right. I'm inclined to agree with her. My, um, my love of movies started then, and that's really where it all comes from. And luckily I got it from my mother who grew up also being a lover of film and she would do things she, my mother was a kind of a person that if there was the favorite movie on at uh, three o'clock in the morning on tv she'd wake me up to watch it and it didn't matter if there was school the next day although she wanted she usually would do it on week weekend week, weekends not weekdays <clears throat> in any event um and sometimes she would make me watch a movie to learn a life lesson like uh like don't do drugs so we she'd make me watch the man with the golden arm by, uh starring frank sinatra directed by otto preminger great movie by the way which is rather jarring to see when you're five or six years old i must admit but one of my favorite life lessons uh was that being being a boy and the baby brother of two older sisters i was pretty much you know damien the antichrist anything a little boy could do to get in trouble i would do and on one occasion instead of scolding or punishing me my mother decided to use psychology and what she did was she saw that there was a movie that was going to be on and she made me watch it forced me to watch it this was my punishment i have to sit and watch this movie from beginning to end and it was a movie called angels with dirty faces starring james cagney uh pat o'brien and sheridan and the dead end kids oh and humphrey bogart um now i don't know if you're familiar with the premise of the film or not i don't know if it's needed to any of your listeners who haven't seen it but to make the point, James Cagney plays, it takes place in the 1930s, James Cagney plays a gangster and grew up his best friend with Pat O'Brien, who was a priest, and he comes back to the old neighborhood and a bunch of boys, the, uh, the dead end kids, admire the heck. Spoiler alert coming up here, but it's important to the story. At, by the end of the film, James Cagney's about to get the electric chair and Pat O'Brien visits him in prison just before he gets the chair and asks James Cagney a big favor. He asks him, when you go to the chair, can you go kicking and screaming so those boys back in the neighborhood won't admire you and won't grow up to be like you? And Cagney tells him, no, you're asking too much. You're taking, you're taking away the one thing I got left in the world that ain't gonna do it, see? So they march him to the chair and just before they strap him in, Cagney starts kicking and screaming and crying and you see a tear in Pat O'Brien's eye. And he goes back and he tells the dead end kids that uh, yes, Rocky Sullivan died the way they said he did. He died kicking and screaming, so don't grow up to be like him. 
the movie was over. I got tears streaming down my eyes. I'm like eight years old. And my mother said, did you learn the lesson that crime doesn't pay? And I told my mother, yeah, mom, I'm wiping away tears. I learned a great lesson. James Cagney's fantastic. And she just rolled her eyes and threw up her hands. <laughs> but that, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was one of my favorite life lessons. And um, along the way, I, uh, being the movie fan that I am, and um, when I was younger, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, here in LA, there were a lot of revival movie theaters in, uh, in the downtown area, Hollywood, and the outlying LA areas. And depending, of course, on what film they were showing, I would, uh, I would go there on a regular basis. I would haunt those places, places like the, this one still exists, luckily, Quentin Tarantino bought it, but I've been going there long before he bought the place. The New Beverly Theater, there was the Fox Venice, there was, uh, oh my gosh, so many. the Vagabond. Uh, I love these places, absolutely love them. And sometimes I'd go with friends, a lot of times I'd go by myself, it didn't bother me to do that. And I'd come home, and if my mom was still awake, she would ask me what the movie was like and how did I like. I mean, that, that's one of the best things about my mother. I, I had a very, what's the word for it, um, conflicted relationship with my mother, like most children do growing up. But the one constant was a love and encouragement and, of, of movies. And um, that lasted forever, as a matter of fact. My mother passed away about six, seven years ago, complications from um, a heart condition. but. Um, she lived about three years late, longer than my father, who uh, died, died of Alzheimer's. And I was fairly close to both of them, and so were my sisters. We had, you know, arguments and conflict and what have you, but for the most part, we got along. And um, she instilled in me, I always like to tell people that my father taught me how to love, my mother taught me how to love movies. And I know that sounds comparatively trite, but because of what movies have meant to my life, it's, it, it's hardly tried and I have to tell you too not only did I go to revival theaters but I was lucky enough what's that thing that Paul Simon said born at the right time I came at the tail end of the baby boomer generation and there were multiplexes and what have you but the time period of filmmaking late 60s early 70s I'd go to the movies on a weekly basis like I'm sure people used to do and it was a time when the rules of filmmaking was changing in this country because I'm rather jingoistic when it comes to films. I, I, I love American films. I like other countries as well in terms of their films. It depends on the film, of course. But as, as, as a rule, American films are my favorite. And the film, the American films of the 70s were just, in my opinion, the last golden age of filmmaking. They, they broke all the rules. There was no more studio system. The production, the old production code was gone. Uh, the stars that were in movies weren't all necessarily, you know, sex symbols and matinee idols. They were regular looking people um, and that showed in the films. I mean, there were the obvious blockbuster ones that were great, The Godfather and, and French Connection and other really great movies, but they also, movies like Scarecrow with Gene Hackman and Al Pacino, that's not seen that much, but one of my favorites. Um, and countless, oh, Who'll Stop the Rain with Nick Nolte. <clears throat> in any event, um, all that said, there's a thing that people say about um, when when you get a great idea that, that it's often a light, you know, it's not necessarily a light bulb that goes off over your head so much as the, a whack in the back of the head with a two by four. And that's how it was for me because I wasn't aware of the fact that I had any kind of writing ability. I discovered it when I was in college, let's say, um, uh, junior college. I was a fair to Midland student in school. Um, and if there was a, if I had to take a test that required an essay question, that I could sink my teeth into. And I always did well on essay questions. I could pile it on like nobody's business, but it never dawned on me that I was never good at it. It was just, to me, it was just a way to get through something. Um, opportunities presented themselves on several occasions and I would take it. And uh, one of them being, for example, a friend of mine who worked on a newspaper here in L.A. said there was an opening for a, a job, excuse me, there was a job opening on the paper he worked on for a film critic. And he asked me if I was interested. Now, at the time, I'm not exaggerating this. It sounds like a, a comic book. I was working as a janitor in a hospital. And, and I said, sure, Randy, I'll take it. So what I wound up doing was living the existence of a kind of a comic book character. By day, I was cleaning the hospital, and at night, I was going to movie premieres. It was uh, a strange existence. And um, then I moved on to uh, 
moved to New Jersey with a friend of mine because I wanted a change of, of lifestyle, or whatever. And while I was there, I got a job at a newspaper, uh, a, a local newspaper called Cranberry Publications that put out five monthly newspapers in, in different that were geared towards different townships in New Jersey. And it was there I met my girlfriend, who I, I still live with. And um, I always like to tell, once again, comic book reference, I like to tell people, I was Jimmy Olsen and she was Lois Lane, uh, although she worked in sales. And I worked my way up from being a stringer and part-time uh, uh, reporter to assistant editor. And then in the month, the month I turned 30, everything seemed to implode and collapse. I won't go into detail about it because it's boring and, and rather negative, and I don't like to dwell on the negative. Suffice to say, I moved back home with my tail between my legs to California. And then eventually I got myself a better job on another newspaper doing the same kind of thing. Um, and I, it didn't always pay the bill, so I wound up having to be a waiter. And while I was there working as a waiter, there was, I had a regular customer, a gentleman by the name of Mike Miller. And Mike and I would have great conversations. He always ordered the same thing. And at one point, he, we would talk about all kinds of things, uh, be it social or cultural, political, which was kind of surprising since he was a Republican, a very strong Republican. I'm, I'm a lifelong Democrat. And we converse. And at one point, he asked me, if I had any experience working in uh, the publishing field. And I said, only as a part-time journalist on a newspaper. And he asked me if I wanted a job as a proofreader for his company. He ran a company called Miller Educational Materials, which was the one portion of three separate companies he ran. And it was local, it was small, it was literally around the corner from the restaurant near where I lived. And he said he needed somebody to help him with his catalog. Would I be willing to uh, do it on a temporary basis, contractually? I said, sure. And I got the job because the guy he had doing it was making too many mistakes, like enlisting a book, listing, um, I believe it was, I'm trying to remember, oh, oh Moby Dick, he listed the author as uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. And, Big mistake, yeah. <laughs> Herman Melville, yeah, right. we all love him. Right, right, and, that, and that's how I got the job, basically. Because he asked me, uh, one time when he came in for lunch, he goes, I'm curious, do you know who wrote Moby Dick? And I said, yeah, Melville, why? And he went, Oh, good, because the guy I hire thinks it's Robert Louis Stevenson. <laughs> so anyway, I got the job and that job turned into a permanent job. So I did the catalog for him uh, for what eventually became four companies, thought I think about it. Um, he kept branching out and I also, I, I learned so much the seven years I worked for Mike and it just was every, eventually I became general manager of the publishing arm of the company and I had a staff under me. And, and keep in mind, I had no training in this at all. It was just literally on the job training. I never finished college. I would take classes and drop them and take classes. It's very common, I'm sure. But um, I got a heck of a lot of training working for Mike. Now, after 9-11, the publishing industry, especially in terms of textbooks for schools and what have you, they cut their budgets enormously. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that or not. And, and, and inversely, that meant uh, Mike had to make some cuts in his company, and one of them was me, as well as several other middle managers. So I was kind of cut, cut loose. Now at the time that I was doing that, I was also in conversation with a gentleman by the name of uh, Marshall Terrell. And I came in contact with Marshall Terrell because Marshall wrote a book about Steve McQueen. And for your listeners, you may not know, I don't know the age group of, of your audience, but Steve McQueen was, a, was the biggest male movie star of the 1960s. And I was a fan. I was a big fan, which I could tell you why later, but that aside, uh, Marshall wrote a book about Steve McQueen called uh, Steve McQueen, Portrait of an American Rebel. I read it, I liked it, and I, I read pretty much everything ever written about Steve McQueen. And at the time the book came out, I liked what Marshall had written, but I also noted a few obvious mistakes, such as the fact that I know where he got this wrong from. It was from another book that he mentioned that Dustin Hoffman was Oscar nominated for Papillon. No, he wasn't. Um, the movie only got one Oscar nomination for Best uh, Musical Score. But anyway, um, and also too, he never mentioned that Steve McQueen had auditioned for the Actors Studio in New York, which is extremely prestigious and he auditioned and he got in. And I think that's in volumes about uh, Steve McQueen as an actor because not everybody who auditions gets in and he didn't mention that in his book. So on a lark, now keep in mind, this, is, this was before the internet. On a lark, I saw on the jacket flap that Marshall lived in Arizona. 
So I looked up in the yellow pages for Marshall Terrell. I found him. I called him, and wonder of wonders, he answered the phone. And he told me that he was going to be in California at a certain day and time. Would you, would you like to get together for dinner? And we did, and we talked. And in talking, he said to me that you really know a lot about movies, Dwayne.、Um, have you ever thought of writing your own book? And I said, Yeah, you wrote it. <laughs> I would love to have written about Steve McQueen. And then, because before Marshall wrote the book on McQueen, he had been in、um, he had been a,、um, a marketing、uh, expert. He, he、uh, I forgot the company he worked for, but he knew a lot about marketing. In any event, he, with marketing in mind, strategically, he said, "What about somebody who, who's a really big star that you'd be interested in writing a book about? Who's never really had a definitive book written about them?" So we started going through different names and people, and we came, we eventually landed on Lee Marvin、uh, because I'm a fan, and I thought, "Hmm, this might work. Let me see." And I started looking, doing some research, real. Minor, insignificant research at first, dipping my toe in the water, as it were. And the more I found out about the man, the man—not necessarily his films—I've always been a fan of his films. But the more I found out about the man, the more intrigued I became, to the point where I found myself getting sucked into this vortex, fascinating details. And I decided to commit, and I decided I'm going to write a book on Lee Marvin. Now, saying that and having it happen, worlds apart. Very different situation. It took me almost 20 years, and in the interim, I did all the research that I did, which meant I was able to get a lot of major exclusives, mainly in terms of the interviews I got. I was the first person to interview his brother. He had an older brother, and I met with him. And、uh, that's a real quick, interesting story. I found out that、uh, Lee Marvin's brother, Robert Marvin, was an art teacher in the New York City school district. Now my cousin is a shop steward in the New York City、uh, Teachers Union, and I asked her if she could find him, and she said, "Well, if he was in the union, I could find him." Turns out she said she got back to me and said, "There's a Robert Marvin in Bearsville, New York, near Woodstock. Do you think that might be him?" I said, "I really do." She gave me his phone number. I called him, and the minute he answered the phone, I knew it was him. He sounded just like his brother. He had his brother's voice, his brother's attitude.、Uh, he was, in many ways, a personification of Lee Marvin. And we got to talking, and eventually, I convinced him into letting me get more information from him. And eventually, I I、uh, flew up to Woodstock, New York, and stayed with him for about a week and a half. And he literally opened up the family archives to me and told me wonderful, wonderful stories that nobody had ever heard before. He gave me access to the family. History,、uh, photos, tr school transcripts, service records—you name it—and that helped get a lot of exclusivity、uh, to to my research, especially the chapter involving Lee's、uh, time in the Marines during World War II. He was stationed in、uh, in the Pacific, and the letters he wrote home. When I wrote that chapter in the book, I didn't have to write the book at all. That was all told in Lee's own words. All I did was edit and transcribe the letters he wrote. And、um, it's all in chronological order, and it's a very powerful tale he tells. And I also interviewed his first wife. I interviewed his his son,、uh, his career long agent, his lawyer during the infamous Palimony suit. All of which were exclusive. Nobody had ever spoken to these people, and it made up the bulk of the book, as well as other research I did, you know, on top of that. And consequently, I was working at、um, another newspaper at the time. Uh, before I started working for Mike Miller, and my editor—it was for a newspaper called the Jewish, Jewish Community Chronicle here in Long Beach—and my editor, this wonderful woman named Harriet Ellis, was getting very frustrated watching me trying to get this book published, and said, "What is your problem? Why can't this thing come to market?" And I said, "Harriet, I need an agent. I can't get an agent to save my life. A literary, especially in those days, a literary agent is everything. That's how you get your foot in the door." And she told me her nephew was the managing editor of L.A. Weekly. Gosh, I just the name just went right out of my head. The last name's Kaplan. He doesn't work there anymore. He works at the Washington Post. But anyway, she said, "Let me call my nephew and see if he can suggest anything." So she did. I got in touch with him. He said, "You ever heard of a gentleman named Mike Hamelberg?" And I said, "No, I don't know who that is." And he said, "Well, that's the、uh, that's the advice I've gotten from everybody here on the paper. Give him a call. See if he'd be interested." And I did. I met with Mike Hamelberg. I went to his office. And I have to tell you, because I love I love repeating the story. Mike Hamill had a rather now I should preface this by 
telling you as well, I had gone through three other agents. All of them were, I'm sorry, I'll say it, I won't say who they were by name, but they were useless, absolutely useless. They didn't help me at all. They would never get back to me. Um, they would get frustrated with me because I would call them once a month and they would call me impatient. I don't see how once a month is impatient, but anyway, going through trials and tribulations. But when I met with Mike Hamelberg, I had written a proposal, I sent it to him. He liked it, I went to his office. Now, mind you, I found out later, Mike Hamelberg was, act, is, was actually quite a legendary literary agent. His clients ran the gamut of American um, pop culture. He, he, he represented Jackie Robinson for his autobiography, uh, Roy Rogers, uh, oh my gosh, just so many wonderful people. Robin Cook, who wrote The French Connection, so many great, great literary and, and pop culture figures he represented. But you'd never know it by how incredibly moderate his office was. It was this little white office with two tables, two desks, I mean, and one had a pile of papers on it and the other had a couple of phones. And when I came to his office, he was on the phone, but behind him was this huge mural that covered the whole wall of the poster for the film, The Yakuza. Uh, great, once again, another example, a great early 70s film that starred Robert Mitchum. And he got off the phone and I was admiring the, uh, the mural and he said, you like that? And, and I told him, I said, Mike, that's one of my favorite movies ever. I love that film. And then Hamelberg smirked and he went, oh, so you're the one who saw it. Are, are you a fan of the movie too? And that's when he smirked again. And, went, I could, and I thought, whoa, that's cool. I'm in the right office. <laughs> so turns out Lee Marvin almost starred in that film, by the way. Um, so any, in any event, um, Mike worked. He, 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 put, he put the work in to see if I can get, he can get the book to, uh, to market to a publishing house. Now in the interim, this was in the late 90s when I first came in contact with by my father, as I mentioned earlier, contracted uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is kind of a family legacy. Both of his older brothers got it and died of it, and then my father did. And because my mother was at her wit's end, I wound up taking over my parents' estate. I saw to it that my father was cared for in a nursing home, and, and their, their financial affairs were put in order because my mother couldn't do it anymore, and both of my sisters weren't able, and I somehow got nominated to do it so i did it then after my father passed and the arrangements were made my mother got sick and she had to be moved into a retirement home and that went on for a couple of years and blah, 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 blah. all right when all that was done when the smoke finally cleared talking about six seven years later i by the way i was still working on the book at the same time i was getting information researching it but i was cataloging it away and i kind of revamped the proposal once I was able to get back to it and I called Mike. Now, I didn't even know, because when I met Mike, he was older. I didn't even know, number one, if Mike was still alive and number two, if he was alive, if he was still working or if he was retired. So I called him and I said, Mike, are you still uh, working? And he went, I'm, I'm semi-retired. I'm not taking on any new clients. And I said, do you consider me a new client? And he went, no, what do you got? So I, I resent the proposal. He loved it. He shopped it around. And in less than a month's time, he had a publisher. Uh, but this is all within a 20 year time span that, that once we reconnected again. And that publisher was a gentleman named Tim Schaffner of Schaffner's Press, once again, out of Arizona, rather uh, 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 coincidentally, which is where Lee Marvin spent the last years of his life. He lived in Tucson. And that's one of the reasons why the book wound up getting published because Tim Schaffner read the proposal, liked it, but was not a fence. And he was asking friends and neighbors about it. Apparently, they all knew Lee Marvin, and that helped. They also great things about it so Tim Tim eventually accepted the proposal Mike negotiated the contract and I wrote the book and much to no one's surprise especially not Mike Hamilton and I but to everybody else when the book came out in paperback a year after it came out in 2013 it made the New York Times bestsellers list at number four now I know this sounds like a back slapping, slapping myself and bragging, which I guess in essence I am, but if you're gonna have something like that happen, you might as well. Because I was turned down either via the previous agents I had or on my own attempting to contact the publisher countless times with the same project being told that nobody's interested in the book on Lee Marvin. He's been gone too long. People don't know who he is. People don't remember him. I heard that a lot. And Consequently, when the book did came out, come out, excuse me, it not only was on the New York Times bestsellers list, the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers list, Publishers Weekly, it also won several awards. 
Uh, it won the bronze in um, in biography and in independent publishers uh, association. It won book of the year for Forward Magazine independent books and several others. But the best I heard in terms of its success was Tim Schaffner had gone to an annual meeting of the independent publishing group distributors, IPG. They they distributed the book. And several of the other publishers in the IPG family came up to Tim and said, boy, you got some some product with that Lee Marvin book. Wish we had published it. Keep in mind, several of these gentlemen were the gentlemen who would turn down the book in the first. Place. So, you know, what's the old saying? Revenge is a dish best served cold. I got my sweet revenge. Yeah, that's wasn't awesome. wasn't looking for revenge. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wasn't looking for revenge, but it was just a nice way to say I was right. In, in in pursuing that and so there you have it story we uh my getting the lee marvin book published i can mention some of the other projects i worked on as well if you like yeah you you you've written several so we'll go ahead and let's talk about everything you've done okay um well initially it's so funny because it all comes back to the lee marvin project uh there's this organization i found out about called when i was researching the book called the bsol and the bsol stands for bastard sons of lee and it was a bunch of Gen Xers in Orange County that started it because apparently there's an organization, a secret organization called the Sons of Lee Marvin. And the Sons of Lee Marvin are made up of a bunch of baby boomers that were started by a filmmaker, a uh, radically independent filmmaker, Jim Jarmusch, who's a big Lee Marvin fan. I found this out during Love the him. stage. Love of, him. Oh, good, good. But, um, remember I said earlier that, that I just kind of was tipping my toe in the water of research? Well, one of the first things I discovered about Lee Marvin was the Sons of Lee Marvin. And I'm backtracking this a little bit. There was an article in Film Comment magazine. It was a semi-regular column written by filmmakers called Guilty Pleasures. And it's basically movies that they know are bad, but they like anyway, and why they like them. And number two in Jim Jarmusch's list of 10 favorite films was, in his words, any Lee Marvin movie. He loved Lee Marvin, then he went on to explain why. And then he proceeded to explain about this secret organization called the Sons of Lee Marvin, which included him, it included um, Tom Waits, um, who else, Nick Cave. One of the things that required membership was that you had to look a little like Lee Marvin, which those gentlemen do, by the way. And you had to be a Lee Marvin fan. And then he proceeded to tell the story about how Tom Waits was in a bar once in Northern California. And some guy walked into the bar, came up to the bartender and says, Tom Waits here? The bartender says, yeah, he's in the back, the back table. Now, to me, this sounds like a scene from a Lee Marvin movie. Um, to, uh, this uh, tall, thin, lanky gentleman walked to the back table where Tom Waits was and said, are you Tom Waits? And he said, yeah. And this gentleman said, are you, in, are you part of the Sons of Lee Marvin thing? And then Tom Waits starts getting a little surly and he says, yeah, what the hell is up to you? And the gentleman said, well, I'm Lee Marvin's son and I think it stinks. And I love that story. Apparently, could you imagine? I talked, <laughs> well, it turns out because I got to interview Chris Marvin, it turns out that never happened. It was okay. just a great story that Tom Waits liked to tell people and tell Jim Jarmers. And if anything, Chris Marvin said to me, if anything, he loves the idea of this secret club devoted to his father. And why can't he join? I'm the only real son. Anyway, um, well, it was from that that this guy named Ron Walker started this organization in Orange County called the BSOL, the Bastard Sons of Lee. And I got in contact with him and over a short period of time, I became a charter member. Um, I'm a member of the BSOL. And they used to go to and do the March in the Doodah Parade and everybody had, each of the, uh, the brothers of the BSOL had to dress up like a Lee Marvin character. I was uh, A number one from Emperor of the North, which was a lot of fun to do because I meant I get to dress up like a 1930s hobo. So that was fun. And you, when you march down the street in the Duda Parade in Pasadena, which is kind of a parody of the Rose Parade, and your, your organization is called the Bastard Sons of Lee, you get a crowd of people shouting at you, we love you bastards, it's a lot of fun. So um, from there, one of the other members of the uh, Bastard Sons of Lee was married to a writer who freelanced for this company called Lucent Books. And they did a series of different books and they're all for grade school kids, high school kids, um, young adult. And she was working on a project that they had offered her that she turned down. 
she asked me if I was interested in it. And I asked her what it was. And she said, well, they got a series called People in the News, which is just basically contemporary biographies. And they give you the, uh, the guidelines and uh, how to research and what needs to be in it and what have you. And I said, yeah, absolutely. She gave me the contact info. I contacted the publisher, the editor, excuse me. Uh, and, and they said they had three openings. Well, worked like this. I wrote about, the first one I wrote for them was on Adam Sandler. And when I tell people that, they often go, Adam Sandler, why the hell would you want to write about him? And I said, because the choices were George Herbert Walker Bush, Eminem, or Adam Sandler. And then they would go, oh, well, Adam Sandler, I understand that. But um, part of it, I, I wasn't even sure about Adam Sandler at the time, but it was based on the fact that I had seen a movie he did called um, Punch Drunk Love. And if it wasn't for had the fact that he made that particular film, I would not have been writing about Adam Sandler, but it's a great, great movie. Very much like a 70s film, in my opinion. So Adam Sandler was the first. Then after that, they had assignments, but I could also um, suggest titles if they agreed to it with their editorial board. And most of the work I did, I can say with pride, were ones that I had suggested. I did a book on Will Ferrell, the first book of its kind. I did one on Hilary Swank. Uh, being a two-time Oscar winner at the time. I did two on Hillary Clinton, one when she was still first lady and the other when she was running for president and then the first time and then when she was secretary of state. And I also did one of the first books of its kind on uh, Nancy Pelosi and uh, Denzel Washington, another one I pitched that was kind of fun to do. So that's how those came about. Now, what's interesting, when I tell people I wrote books on those particular subjects, they would often say, ooh, did you get to interview them? And I would say, I wish I did. But because the books were meant to encourage the readers to, to do more research on their own, all of the books were done through existing uh, information. I didn't do any outside, in I didn't interview anybody. I did it through periodicals and the internet and, uh, and those sources, magazines, newspapers, and the like. So, um, and then that required like three separate bibliographies in each book. So, and all of that helped in the writing of the Lee Marvin book because it helped me learn how to write biography. And more importantly, each chapter was broken into a given theme. You don't just say, blah, blah, was born, blah, blah. And in between they did blah, blah, and then they died or retired on blah, blah. That's incredibly boring. You gotta intrigue the reader into finding out more and why this person is even interesting, let alone what they did. So there was a different theme for each chapter in each book. That helped me immensely when I wrote the Lee Marvin book because I wound up doing the exact same thing. Each part of Lee's life were broken into chapters. And the thing about Lee Marvin, which I didn't mention earlier, but why I was so intrigued by him was the more research I did, as I mentioned earlier, the more fascinated I became. Now, I'm a big fan of the post-war era of male actors in this country. I found them to be amazingly versatile, uh, fascinating. They, they endeavored into pretty much every genre that you could think of, from this rainbow of genres to choose from, from you know, sci-fi fantasy, to musicals, to horror, to, to, to uh, rom-coms, crime films, war films, you name it. And the reason why that post-war actor was so intriguing to me was because I had mentioned earlier the the studio system was coming to an end in the in the 50s because of the invasion of that monster in people's living room of television and also several infamous lawsuits that ended the caste system in hollywood and cast with an e at the end because that's how it worked it was uh, legalized slavery and thanks to olivia de Havilland, who won her case and ended the uh servitude there was also the eventual breakdown of the production code so anything goes be it uh, uh, nudity uh, that's perceived as obscenity and extreme violence and what have you. Now, at first, and still is, a lot of it is very ex exploit exploitative, exploitative, but also, too, it meant the exploration of themes that had never been explored before in terms of interpersonal relationships uh, with men and women and, and men with each other and what have you. And that generation of actor, many of them were matinee idols in the 50s that then became middle-aged or older in the 60s and 70s. Look at those films and be astounded because I was. Robert Mitchum, Lee Marvin, Gregory Peck, Marlon Brando, William Holden, Burt Lancaster, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, Kirk Douglas. If you look at the films those guys made, well, first of all, throughout their careers, but when they got older, it's an amazing group of films that have held up in time a lot better than 
a lot of other actors. And like I said, they were amazingly versatile. And to get back to Lee Marvin, his, every, I've, I've always held to the belief that if you're going to have a successful film career, you have to have a kind of a, a, a theme run through your work. Every actor does. Um, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious, but it's there. And with Lee, because of what he went through during World War II, I discovered on my own, without you know being a behavioral psychologist or clinical psychologist physician, he he suffered from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, from his experiences both in the war and before the war, his upbringing, his family, and that that carried over into his work. Pretty much every film he ever made, whether he was a star or not, because he suffered a very long apprenticeship in the film industry before he made it big in the 60s, there was a, a, a theme of violence in all of his work. And it didn't matter if it was a crime film, a war film, a Western. He explored the depths of man's inhumanity to man so consistently that no other actor had ever done it before. And I was fascinated by that. First, on the level of, you know, where did that come from? And then um, how he was able to do it. And it had never been done on that level before. And he did it pretty much his entire career, almost till the day he died. His last film being a live action cartoon, Delta Force, which is kind of sad, but that aside. I discovered what that kind of acting was all about. And it's all on the printed page. It's all there in the book. And I, I was amazed to discover I have a friend, a film historian by the name of Bill Crone, who wrote probably the definitive book on Alfred Hitchcock called Hitchcock at Work, which I helped him with a little bit. He, he said to me, um, the great thing about researching film as both a fan and what you can find out and put out for an audience is discovering how the rabbit got out of the hat. I love I loved that uh, metaphor because I was very quick to discover the amount of amazing things Lee Marvin uh, uh, contributed to a given scene or a given movie. And many of the people I spoke with, co-workers, directors, uh, crew members, stuntmen, other actors, they cited example after example after example of what Lee would do that no other actor would do. And, and, his, and, and the run of films he had from like 64 or five until about the mid 70s, they were some of the greatest action films ever made to this day. The most famous being The Dirty Dozen, made within that same time period. But it started with the TV movie that was released theatrically called The Killers, with uh, Clue Gulliger, Andrew Dickinson, and Ronald Reagan in, in his last film. And then uh, Capaloo, which you won the Oscar for, uh, The Dirty Dozen, Hell in the Pacific, uh, The Professionals. If you haven't seen that movie, I highly, highly recommend it. It's one of the best action, Western action films ever made. Um, Emperor of the North, uh, Monty Walsh, uh, which is my girlfriend's favorite film he ever did. It's such a beautiful film. And it's about the death of the West. And, uh, oh gosh, so many movies. Um, I can't recommend Lee Marvin movies enough. And if people have asked me, what would you like to see happen with the um, success of the Lee Marvin book? And I said, well, aside from it being a success in and of itself, I'd like people to watch more Lee Marvin movies. And thankfully, through the advent of cable and DVD and now streaming services, I'd like to think people are. And um, they're discovering an American classic worthy of rediscovery. I'm trying to figure out the chronology of, of what you've been doing. Now, the Leave Marvin book is your most recent? Yes, that, the, that book came out in 2013. The paperback came out in 2015. But I still do an ongoing blog whenever things about Lee Marvin come up in uh, the media. Okay, and the other, the, the other books that you wrote for young adults, those were done prior at, at oh, another, yeah, they were. in another right. aspect of your career. Right, and the, or the, yeah, the young adult books I did in the early 2000s, or right after I had worked for Miller Educational, which was, I, I can't even remember now, I think, from, I think I worked at Miller from like 1995 to 2001, something like that, and then 9-11 and then, you know, hit. And um, I, I, I did some writing and got my first published work was at Miller Educational. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, he was looking to do some publishing in the young adult market himself for um, at-risk students and ESL students in the sort of the second language. And he needed some books written and given series on different subjects, um, all all fiction. So believe it or not, even though I'm a fan of, I mean, I prefer nonfiction. The first published work I ever had was 
uh, a work of fiction. I wrote a, a fictional book about uh, Steve McQueen, and it, it was called The Cooler King. And um, I did it one for the romantic romance series called Connie's Secret, and a horror book. I now I don't remember the title, but anyway, um, that's what I meant before when I said that Miller Educational gave me a an on-the-job training in the publishing industry. I learned every aspect of it, and including being able to have published work. Well, it sounds it's fortunate that uh, during this time with COVID, how it's affected so many people in their businesses that you're a writer. That seems like, you know, it, I imagine it hasn't affected you at all as far as your career, the COVID. Well, uh, um, you would think that would be the case, but in actuality, um, sadly, that's not the case. And, I'm still coming up against the same, uh, I don't want to just say prejudice, the same hard-headedness I came up against when I tried to get the Lee Marvin book published. One of the biggest problems for me is now, you would think people would be reading books more now that they're sequestered, but they're not. They're online more. And um, social media now reigns supreme. One of the, and the problem for me was in 2016, Mike Hamelberg, God bless him, passed away we lost Mike and uh with the passing of Mike Hamelberg I, from that moment on I've been in kind of free fall I've I've been trying to find another agent and that's just you know I would love to be able to find another Mike Hamelberg good luck there but any agent at this point and my publisher Tim Shafton when we signed a contract for the Marvin book he had a, a codicil that whatever project I do next he wants first look so I had something in mind and I had uh uh, ran it past Mike Hamelberg, who loved the idea. Uh, just a real quick story before I, say, I, you know, I tell you about the project. Because Tim Shafter put that codicil in the uh, initial contract for Lee Marvin, I didn't contact Mike Hamelberg about this idea I had. I contacted Tim directly. And Tim said, put together a proposal, and he also made an offer that was the worst advance I've ever seen for a new title. And I was rather disheartened by it. And with that said, I contacted Mike Hamelberg. And as great a relationship as I had with Mike, it was the only time he ever got mad at me. When I told him about the project, he was like, what the hell's the matter with you? Why did you get to Tim without contacting me first? What do you think? I do this for fun? This is my job, Dwayne. And I, you know, hemmed and hawed. And I was like, well, I didn't want to bother you, Mike, and blah, blah. So I sent Mike the proposal. He loved it. He contacted Tim. Tim got back to me and offered me like five times the initial amount because he had spoken to Mike. And I said, Tim, it's the same project. What changed? And Tim said, Mike's just a good negotiator. And that's what makes a great literary agent, folks. So anyway, what the project was with the idea I had based on what I had told you a moment ago about some of those post-war actors that I thought to focus on the ones that were not stars when they were younger because they were good looking guys like Paul Newman or, or um, gosh, Marlon Brando, William Holden, who everybody knew who they were from the beginning of their career and slowly worked in the middle age and made great movies in the middle age, Last Tango in Paris, uh, Network, uh, Wild Bunch for William Holden and others. I thought, what about the concept of three particular actors whom everybody knew who they were, but they were never really big stars until they became middle-aged because of specific roles they were in in the 70s. And I got this idea based on a book I read by Peter Biskin called uh, Easy Riders and Raging Bulls about how the new, new um, how, how the sex and drug, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll generation saved the, hot, uh, the motion picture industry. And it's a great book, by the way. But that aspect of it fell through the cracks of his research. He wrote all about the new Hollywood. He wrote about Scorsese and Coppola and Spielberg and the new young actors like De Niro and Pacino and Jack Nicholson, but nothing about those already established actors that were having a kind of a comeback. So I narrowed it down to these three gentlemen. Um, and it was George C. Scott, Charles Bronson, and Walter Matthau. Worlds apart in terms of their screen personas and the films they made, however, they were all members of the greatest generation. They were all veterans of the war. They all lived through the depression. They all served extremely lengthy apprenticeships and wound up becoming superstars, mainly based on one performance that carried them into the top 10 uh, of film stars throughout the 70s. With Jersey Scott, it was obviously Patton. Walter Matthau, it was The Odd Couple. And Bronson, it was Death Wish. 
very different actors, very different films, but it established them. And what's so fascinating to me as well is the fact that this was all during the youth obsessed generation of the 70s. Movie studio head really didn't know what to make of films anymore. But, you know, what, what they had been doing wasn't working. Everything was becoming more independent. Um, the foreign film market had busted wide open. So there was a new venue, but how do you please that audience? So they didn't know what to do. And when Easy Rider came along, it changed all the rules. So they were making a lot more youth oriented films. But you would think that would be the last place or time a guy like George C. Scott, Walter Matthau, or Bronson would have a successful career. And yet they were more successful than ever. I love paradoxes like that because it shows you, you know, rules were made to be broken. And, you know, S. Scott Fitzgerald once famously said that there's no second act in American life. Well, those three guys proved that there are. And uh, Mike Hamelberg loved the proposal, gave it to Tim. Tim read it. He was on a fence until ultimately he said no, because he said he wanted it to be more, some, uh, more of a tapestry between the three choices. And he didn't see that. So that's where it's at now. I've still got the same proposal. I think it's well done. I don't have an agent in which to uh, shop it around. And most um, publishing companies, which are getting fewer and fewer, by the way, won't even look at a proposal unless it's represented by an agent. Um, because an agent kind of s serves as the first filter. They're, they do the job an editor would do if they think something is worthy or, or, or should go into the circular file, like they say. And so once an agent says it's okay to send on to a publishing company, that's half the battle. And I don't have an agent. Um, although there, I, I, I have some possibilities still, irons in the fire. So in the interim, I've done some magazine articles about film subjects. I've done some stuff online for Emmy.com doing interviews. I mean, uh, obviously I prefer retro pop culture, but there's still wonderful things to be written about in the uh, pop culture of today. You know, we're in a golden age of TV since the medium is busted wide open into all kinds of different venues. So there's lots to be written about and lots to be seen and lots to be explored. Lots of ways to see the rabbit come out of the hat as it's being done. And once again, you know, with streaming platforms, yeah, there's sex, yeah, there's violence, yeah, there's you know, exploitation on that level and, 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 and graphic aspects of it. But with things that have started it with like Breaking Bad and, and which I finally got to see the series of and other shows that are being done. Now there's depth. Now there's, there's strong relationships and themes and, and social statements being made, like with, what's the one that wins the Emmy every year? It's in the, uh, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, and I know they did one recent biopic on Gloria Steinem that I heard was wonderful. Things, things like that. They're getting back to story. Story uber alles. I remember hearing Clint Eastwood speak at a screening of Mystic River, where he was asked about how did they do this in that movie and were you drawn to that style or whatever. And he said, any movie I've ever made or anybody else, it always comes down to the one thing and one thing only, story. You've got to have the story. Everything else is just great window dressing. And I agree with him. Even though I'm not a Clint Eastwood fan, I completely agree with that. So when you write, you don't just write something that you're interested in doing. Oh, I mean, obviously you are interested, but you don't write something and then shop that around. You more or less, you shop the idea around before you even actually write the, the book. Is that correct? Yeah, because I discovered from friends of mine who didn't do it that way, that it's really kind of sad and a burnout when you're, when you're spinning your wheels. So if you do the work and the research and then hope somebody reads it, you just wasted a good portion of your life and somebody else's who's not interested in reading it. Um, I had a friend of mine who did a lengthy interview with a well-known character actor and then he started shopping it around. He, you know, he did research, he did the interview, he did the transcription, he molded it, he edited it, and then he started shopping it around and nobody was interested, which is really sad. I like to get the interest first to see if there's a way to you know know that there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel that's not an oncoming train i've written a lot of stuff for film facts magazine which i like um although i know the readership isn't, isn't, isn't that large and once again that started with the lee marvin book i did the initial research and a buddy of mine uh brett coates who is a cartoonist who does garfield with jim davis and he has his own strip called diamond lee lil excuse me and he said, you know, what are you going to do with all the research you've done already, Dwayne? I mean, you're, you're knocking yourself out with all this work, but you're not getting anything out of it. Have you ever thought of taking some of that research and maybe, you know, shopping it around to a magazine? And on a lark, 
I, I contacted Film Facts and I asked them, would you be interested in an article about Lee Marvin? Just, you know, and kind of an overview of his career. And they went, hell yeah. So that was the first piece I wrote for Film Facts. And from there, because I had interviewed the late, great Woody Strode, and that was his last interview. If you're not familiar with who Woody Strode is, you might remember him best as the gladiator in Spartacus who beat Kirk Douglas, but was killed by Lawrence Olivier anyway. Uh, great presence, Woody Strode. Uh, uh, he was a, an, you know, an, an, an Olympian track star. He was a he he was the the Jackie Robinson of the NFL. He, he broke the color line in the NFL when he played for the Rams. He and um, Kenny Kent Stabler and oh god, Kenny no, excuse me, Ken Washington and two other players. They were all hired but by the LA Rams at the same time. And fascinating man, fascinating story, fascinating stuff and. That became an article for Film Facts. I also pitched a lot of articles. I wrote about Bobby Darren's acting career, another guy I'm a fan of. I got one of the last interviews with Sam Fuller, the, the uh, writer director. Um, who else? What else did I write? Oh, I wrote about the Rat Pack. I pitched that and they loved it. Um, kind of tongue in cheek thing I did. Um, I grew up on comic books, so I was able to get an interview with my all time favorite comic book artist, a gentleman by the name of Neil Adams. We did a great series of comic books in the 70s, once again, the 70s, a period of incredible artistic creativity in, in pop culture in America. We did a series called Green Lantern, Green Arrow, which explored things from a superhero point of view that had never been explored before at all. And I talked to him about that and other stuff. It wound up being a three-part series, and he was so delighted with the first two parts, he drew the cover for part three. Um, I interviewed Kevin McCarthy, the star of that great seminal classic cult film invasion of the body snatchers and um gosh what which also made the cover um, i interviewed greg hildebrand the graphic artist of all the tolkien novels he and his twin brother tim who had passed away but i talked to him about that uh all kinds of great stuff i love writing for film facts i haven't gotten much work out of film facts lately because mike stein the publisher he's getting on in years and he's not really doing anything new he's doing a lot of retread stuff so um, anybody interested in a prolific writer with a lots of experience who's a New York Times bestseller, you're, I can, you're I can reach. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, available. Yeah, uh, you, uh, you focus mainly on film actors and so forth in your writing. Have you ever considered branching into music? I mean, I know the 70s interest you probably because you were a teenager during that time. And, you know, I was too. So that's yep. where most of my musical interest from early on came from with uh, you know, bands like Led Zeppelin, yes, and yeah. you know, just, just the, the heavy hitters for sure. Uh, but there was so much that happened in the 70s. Had, oh, absolutely. So had it was, it was the rise of the singer songwriter. Right. So, so does that interest you in any way that you might at some point? Sure. And like most people of that time period, I had favorites. Um, one of my personal friends, my sisters used to make fun of me that I would always become a fan of somebody either right after they died or they will die because I became a fan, kind <laughs> which is a inside dark joke i was a big fan of jim croce remember him oh yeah 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 he's kind of large bad, bad leroy brown that, you that bet that's probably yeah. his yeah. most famous and don't mess around with jim and time in a bottle uh yeah i was a big big fan of croce when i was in junior high and then he died in a plane crash uh i was a big fan of bobby darren who died very early from a bad heart you know i was a big fan of uh sam cook who was murdered by a motel uh manager um uh, I was a fan of a lot of great people that died, unfortunately, young. But I'm also a fan, you know, John Lennon, who's a god in my eyes. Um, not just for his music, which was incredible, but for the man that he was. You know, an amazing man. And, uh, oh, so many people. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, big fan of his. Um, but the thing is, of those people I just mentioned, other than maybe Jim Croce, a lot of stuff has been written about all of them. It's, you know, there's a market consideration that's very very strong and very powerful in terms of what gets read, seen and published and what doesn't and that of course like i said is the way i came up with the idea marshall and i came up with the idea of writing about lee marvin but even in that um we considered it marketable marketable but nobody else did for a long time like i said almost 20 years but it, obviously it was it became a new york times bestseller i don't know you know i've often said Everybody wants to be the first person, the publishing industry, they want to be, have, be the first person to have the second great idea. 
originality is really hard to come by. You know, it's, for every successful story in the publishing industry or, or, or an author, somebody, for example, like Margaret Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind, she had been turned down by every major publisher in America before it finally got published, decades after she wrote it. Uh, same thing with Kerouac, who, who created a new style of writing. Um, you know, you, it's, you would think once you've been published, doors open up. It doesn't always work that way. It, it depends on the subject and what you're dealing with. And eventually, I'm also a firm believer of hold on tight to your dream in that had I not believed in the Lee Marvin project so well, it would never have come to fruition. And eventually it did. You've got to be patient. You've got to be diligent. As Lee Marvin's wife said to me when I interviewed her and she saw how long I had been working on it, she said, aren't you sick of Lee? You know, I was married to him and I got sick of the man. How could you maintain this enthusiasm? And I said, I don't know, it just, what's, I've always been lucky in that I've had a very strong sense of curiosity. Once I'm interested in something, it becomes almost a, an obsession, a passion. I can't find out enough about a given subject, be it, you know, a music, a film, an actor, a piece of music, an actor, a musician, comic book, uh, a novel, you know, I'm, um, it keeps life interesting to be that interested in other things. So there's going to be something out there. I know that. And, and, and my, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The problem I'm having is getting people to share my passion. But eventually they do. That sounds like a good place to stop unless there's something else you want to add. Uh, we could talk about your social media if you want to, you know, put that out there. And sure, uh, well, I, have, I haven't been keeping track of the time. How, um, how's it looking? We're, we're hitting about an hour. Oh, see, I told you, get me started, man. I won't shut up. Yeah, you did good. I, um, you know, with the advent of, of social media, I got kind of pulled kicking and screaming into it by my publisher. who told me every book he puts out, he's a small publishing house, by the way. He only does like three or four books a year. And, and um, he told me that every book he publishes has to have a platform of a website. And I didn't want to do it. He said, you have to, it's going to be in the contract. And I said, okay. So I started a website and luckily it wasn't nearly as hard as I thought it would be. And it's thankfully, I, I have an Apple computer, which, it's, um, which is like to me, the difference between a stick shift and an automatic. I can drive a stick shift, but I can't use a PC. And so it's like having a, you know, a stick shift for a computer it's hosted on Apple. It's called, the website is called pointblankbook.com based on the fact that the biography on Lee Marvin is called Lee Marvin Point Blank, which is available online and anywhere. There's bookstores still open or selling. Um, it's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Noble, other places, Powell's, Books A Million. But in any event, I blog pretty regularly even, and it's been six years since the book came out, but I'm still finding stuff I can comment on on uh, social media via Point Blank Book, which also includes uh, reviews that are all good, of course. And luckily there wasn't a whole lot of negative reviews anyway, but if there was one, I'm sure hell not gonna put it on a website. Uh, but there's, there's reviews, there's, a, there's my bio, there's regular blog entries, there's events, um, links to purchase the book, and uh, stuff I had done about the book, um, other photos, other, other interviews, Anything that happened in social media that affects the work or life of Lee Marvin, regular postings about where you can see films of his, uh, things like that. And I always give great, great background info on that to interest any, uh, any, anybody who clicks on it. So if you want to know more about me and or especially Lee Marvin, you can find that on pointblankbook.com.